I, I kind of tune stuff out like this because worship is music. Worship isn't music. I always like to think of the word worship as coming from the word worship. How much is this thing called faith? How much is this relationship that you have with Jesus Christ worth? And whatever the worth it is, that's where worship comes from. Who he is to you, in you, and for you. You don't have to be able to sing. You don't have to really like music and all of those things to worship. It comes from the place of how much, how much worth is this thing called faith in your life is Jesus. I'm coming back to that place. It says it's all about you, Jesus. Especially for, for people like us and the worship team and, and, and the leadership. You know, we come here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And it becomes very routine about what we're trying to do. And we have to really discipline ourselves to say, this is about Jesus. This is about Jesus. And as leadership, we just invite you to be about Jesus with us. Not to put on a show. You know, as Mark was saying about the author of this song was talking about. But I think, you know, before you get ready to receive what God has to say, some of you might just internally need to say sorry to God. I'm sorry, Lord, for making my faith something that it's not supposed to be. I'm sorry, Lord, for what I've made it to be instead of what it should be. Who you are in me. Forgive me, God, for that. So just really, you know, take a moment and do that. Just, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because it's all about you. It's all about Jesus. God is, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Jamie. God is a mysterious God, isn't he? Right? Sometimes we're just, it's easy to just, you know, there's too much of us. You know, I've, I've always loved John the Baptist's prayer is that he would decrease so that God would increase in his life. Some of us, it's kind of like, God, I want you in my life. I mean, I, I don't plan on going anywhere. So, but if you could just rise to my level, that'd be great. And, and then you and I, we could, we could like coexist together. It'd be cool. You'd be like my roommate, right? But John the Bass says, no, my prayer is more and more that I decrease so that Christ in me can increase. You know, God is such a, you know, it's a funny, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this joke, <clears throat> and, and you probably have, but it's kind of funny, maybe think of it this morning at the last minute, and uh, we'll, we'll call the, the little girl Lucy. Lucy is praying to God, and so she asks God, God, how long is a million years to you? And God says, well, Lucy, it's only but a second. She's like, wow. Then she says, God... What about a million dollars? What's a million dollars to you? And God said, well, Lucy, it's just but a penny. She thinks about it and she goes, God, can I have a penny? <laughs> and God says, sure, in a second. <laughs> <laughs> you think about it, right? <clears throat> Try to make God fit our understanding. He's, he can be a mysterious God, but he's revealed himself in Christ, and he's revealed himself in the Spirit. He gave us the Spirit of the living God to help us to follow, to obey, to move, to remain <clears throat> in him and be with him. We've been talking about that. We're spending a few weeks on this Holy Spirit this part of God that we don't ever really spend a lot of time with because we don't fully understand the Spirit. Yet, it is what you use for your faith when we're praying and worshiping. I mean, this is kind of the time in, in, the, in, the, in the world that God has planned. This is where the Holy Spirit is shining. This is, he is alive. He is, a, he is well. And let me tell you something. I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes. We in the church tend to over-spiritualize things. And we tend to over-spiritualize the Spirit, much, much because we don't understand it. So, of course, we tend to do that. But 
The Spirit has been given to us as a deposit. We talked about that last week, an advocate guaranteeing our inheritance. And, but he's given to us to help us to walk in faith with Jesus Christ. Now, it's not always easy to do, right? Amen? Some of you, right? Some of you have got mastered it. That's great. You should be teaching. But we must learn who, what, and how the Holy Spirit functions in our life. We've spent a few weeks talking about kind of who he is, who he is in the Trinity, in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Spend a little bit of time who he is. Today we're going to talk about, well, what, we understand kind of who he is, but we don't always fully understand what he does. And then we'll spend a few more weeks talking about and, and how that happens. And so I know it all seems very similar and together, but we really want to spend some time um, dissecting this. It's a powerful statement in John chapter 4. And many of you, how many of you know this story? I never like to assume people know this. But how many of you know the story of the Samaritan woman? Jesus encounters her. This is the story of a woman. Some of you might not recognize it by me saying that, but you might recognize it when I say that Jesus meets a woman at a well, and he has a conversation with this woman at the well. And the woman, if you remember the story, if it helps you a little bit, this woman was not, did not have a good reputation, we'll say. And so this woman that Jesus encounters at the well is a, is a powerful story in John chapter 4. I encourage you to read it because it's a message for all of us. I always say, find yourself in a story. You know who you are in the story of the woman at the well? The woman. And so, and even if you're a man, right? And so at some point we all have to realize that uh, we are in need of Jesus. So, but there's this powerful, and, and you need to understand a few things about this, but there's a statement in there that has always jumped out at me as several statements in the Bible have. But this one says he had to go through Samaria. So Jesus, while on his way, I don't know if you can see this map. Um, I put this map up because if you look at John chapter 4, it says that while uh, he's going from Judea to Galilee. So you can see, that I should have brought a pointer, but can you see the Judea down there? It's kind of all capitals, right? And you can't really see very well on this map, but on the map it has like kind of dotted lines and how people travel. And then there's Samaria. You can kind of see it says Plain of Sharon. It's right there, Samaria, kind of a little bit higher than halfway up. And then just to, just down away from it says Sikkar. Um, so this is the region. Jesus is in the area of Judea, and he's going to travel up to Galilee, which is a little bit closer to the top of there. Now, when people from Galilee would travel to come to Jerusalem, which was the holy city, is where they gathered to um, celebrate the feasts and do those things. They all came, that's where the temple was. It wasn't like in America where you only have to walk three feet to get to a church, right? Because there's a church on every corner. Everybody went to temple in Jerusalem. And so they would travel, and they would, people from Galilee didn't have too much problem, but they would go through, straight through, again, you can't see on the map, through Samaria to Jerusalem. But here's the thing. Most Jews, um, and Jews of prominence, Jews like especially Pharisees, Jewish leaders, religious leaders, they especially would not go through Samaria. In fact, they would take a longer route, and they would go up kind of the uh, Perea and up in there and kind of come around up to Galilee so as to avoid Samaria. That was, a, that was a very common practice. In fact, they didn't even really want to be known for going through that town. Because they believed that the Jews in Samaria were um, dirty. That, that we don't associate with their kind. Because they were kind of, through the, if you understand the history, they were kind of a, a, a mixed race. Is really what happened. The Jews uh, that were uh, having relations with people who were not Jews and then... Um, and Samaria is kind of known as that. We, we experience some of that racial um, issues today. And so Jesus is saying that he had to go through Samaria when he starts this off. And this has always jumped out at me because most Jews would not go through that area. So Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. In fact, the practice would have been and he would have known the common route that Jews. And Jesus was considered a rabbi, which is a Jewish teacher. So especially Jesus would have known the practice, and it's kind of like, well, you know, it's all about appearances, and I really need to make sure. Let's take the. And he, I'm surprised. It wouldn't surprise me if at least one of the disciples probably thought, "You're going to go through Samaria, huh?" Because most Jews went around Samaria. So this is probably one of the most profound statements in the story: is that Jesus had to go through Samaria. 
And I've looked at all the different versions, and any really version that you look at, any translation or paraphrase, it really has this language that Jesus had to. Now, some of us may not realize this about Jesus. And some people will say, well, Jesus had to go because he knew he was going to encounter a woman at the well. That's not true. We don't know if Jesus knew about the woman at the well or not because what you're doing is you're assuming that Jesus is all-knowing. But Jesus was not all-knowing. That was part of what he set aside in his deity. He also set aside, really, his omnipresence. Jesus wasn't everywhere all the time at the same time. Um, he set aside that part of his deity. And so Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit when he was born, different than you and I, we receive the Holy Spirit at different times in our lives. Depends on who we are, I suppose, and where you're at in the journey. You could receive the Holy Spirit at 90 years old. You could receive the Spirit at 10 years old. And so when you come to salvation in Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. But there's a moment in your journey where you completely give yourself over to that spirit. So it's kind of like he comes in and takes residence. Some of us put him on a shelf and we use him when we need him. And then along the way, you get to the place where the Holy Spirit gets to have ownership of everything in your life. And just complete captivity to the Holy Spirit. And that's going to happen at different people's times. For Jesus... He was completely possessed. Here's a word you all understand. Think of possession. Think of demon possession. People have asked me, what is demon possession? And most of you, unfortunately, you've probably seen horrible, scary movies, which you shouldn't watch. But if you have, you understand that the, the, they paint a very graphic picture of demon possession. What that means is that the demon it has possession of this person's kind of uh, body, soul, and spirit, and it's causing them to do things. So when you think of that same type of possession, but only think of it that the Holy Spirit possesses you. The Holy Spirit owns you. You, be you become a possession of the Spirit. And so Jesus was born fully possessed by the Holy Spirit. So he could only do what the Spirit told him to do. So when it says that he had to go through Samaria, I venture a guess that he's traveling along and he's like, guys, we've got to go through Samaria. And the disciples rarely questioned Jesus, so they just, they just went wherever he said, so they had to go through Samaria. No matter what the world says I should or shouldn't do, and we're talking religious leaders, it would have been a custom, it would have been a tradition that we go around Samaria. You shouldn't be associating with those kinds of people. No good rabbi. I mean, it gets worse. I mean, he ends up, here we have a rabbi, Jewish man, alone with a woman who's really known as not a, of good reputation in a, in a sexual way. She had a lot of boyfriends, we'll just say that, right? And, and here Jesus is alone with her, right? <laughs> By himself, a Jewish man with a, a, a woman, and not just a woman, a Samaritan woman, and not just a Samaritan woman, a Samaritan woman who didn't have a good reputation with Samaria, <laughs> Right? When the disciples finally return with Jesus, they're like, we don't even want to know what's going on. Let's just get your food and go. So the statement that I had to go through Samaria, I mean, there's so many things you look and go, man, what does that mean you had to go? It's totally possessed by the Spirit. You know, when you look at Jesus and the different stories of Jesus, and I just put up just two, I think, but Jesus would often say, I, I can't help but do what the Father tells me to do. When he is questioned about doing things, it's like, I cannot help but do what the Father tells me to do. The Son can do nothing by himself. He can only, he can only do what he sees his Father doing. I mean, you talk about such a possession. You know, you've heard me talk about, when you look at Galatians 5, and it talks about the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, fits of rage, selfish ambition, witchcraft, debauchery, it's horrible things, right? Orgies and all those type of things. Those are those are obvious in the in the in the sinful nature that we have. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So we, we know that verse. And I always like to say it this way, kind of moving from that, Jesus invites us in, and then we have this total possession. And we look at how Jesus, I can I can't help but do what the Father tells me to do. When you study this Jesus, it's full, fully possessed 
by the Holy Spirit. He cannot help but do what the Father tells him to do. When you look at, and this is a way I explain to people, I wonder how many of you got up this morning, right, and you're like, man, I hope that I have an opportunity to be sexually immoral. I'm really going to try. I sure hope you don't think like that. Uh, if, if you do, I'd like to introduce you to Jesus. But, or I hope that, you know, somebody just makes me so mad, I just go off on them. Man, I really need to try to have that happen. Of course you don't. I hope that my mind gets so far in the gutter that I just can't even dig it out. No. In fact, when those things happen to you and you're called out on them or you're caught in them, what do we typically say? I, what? Can't help it. It's that same language, it's that same desperation that I can't help but do this. I, I want to stop. Paul kind of talks about it. You know, I, I know that I, I shouldn't do that. I know that I shouldn't want that. But I can't help it. Because in many ways, we're born, not we are not born possessed by the Spirit. In many ways, we're possessed by our sin nature. Me, 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 me. Don't believe me. Follow that little girl that was just screaming. Come back and tell me what it looks like. <laughs> Right? Kids have a beautiful way of showing you what this in nature is. I want it, so I'm going to whack the kid in the head. I don't see what the problem is. Right? We just teach them later. It's that same language that Jesus says that I can't help but do what the Father tells me. Later he says that he can do nothing on his own but speak what the Father has taught me. Can you imagine becoming so possessed by the Spirit that you cannot help but speak, and some of you not speak, when he tells you not? I'm telling you, there's, time, there's times when I'm up here and it's like, you know, you'd be surprised how this mind works. You don't want to even go there because it'll just exhaust you. But there's times where I'm preaching and I got some stuff going on in my head. And me and the Holy Spirit are having a conversation. I'm like, that'd be a really funny joke. And he said, no, it wouldn't. I'm thinking, it would really be funny. I think people would laugh. I don't want you to say it. And so then I'm like, okay, well, I can't. Right? Because he has a possession. And it's like, zip it. Don't say it, Renee. Or say it. Right? To be so possessed, that's how Jesus was with the Spirit of God. The Spirit owned Jesus' will, essentially. It doesn't mean he didn't have a will. When you become so possessed with the Holy Spirit, you still have a will. But the same will that says, I can't help but do that, is the exact same will that says, I can't help but do what the Spirit tells me to do. That, my friends, is being completely filled, um, uh, set free, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus was born with. Jesus prayed for us the night before he was crucified. And his prayer, and I would I just encourage you to read his prayer because he prayed for you. He prayed for me. It's beautiful to sit there and think, man, I was on Jesus' mind that night. He prayed for those who would believe. And part of his prayer I put up there is that, that those of us that would believe that we would be one. Just as the Father is one. I want you just to sit with that word for a minute. This is what Jesus cried to the Father was the night before he was dying. Lord, my prayer is that what I'm doing, what's going to be happening in these next few, really, hours, is that, Lord, that they are one, just as you are in me and I am in you. I mean, wow. It's absolutely beautiful. I just can't even imagine <coughs> what would it be like to be so one with God, the way Jesus was with God, completely captive. And you imagine that kind of closeness. Well, I'm telling you that I can. And I know that there are some of you in here who have experienced this. Just as Jesus told Philip in John, um, I actually think it's John 14. I think I have the wrong. Oh, no. Well, I just have the wrong reference. That's not 17. I think that's 14. And so it says, I now know that since I have been with Jesus, right? There's this beautiful picture. And so if you're wondering where this is coming from, it's not John 17, it's John 14. And this is where Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in me, trust in God, trust also in me. 
I go to prepare a place for you. Many of you know that scripture. And the disciples are kind of grieved because this is getting ready for him to leave. And he's talking about this language and they're confused. And they're like, just, just before you go, show us the Father. And so his response to Philip is, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So I know that we can I've experienced, I know some of you have experienced, you can experience that kind of closeness with the Father. I know him because I know Jesus. Because I've seen Jesus, the very real Jesus. Not the idea of Jesus, but the very real Jesus that comes alive. The very Jesus that sits with me every morning and walks with me throughout the day through the Spirit of God. He's a very real God to me. And I have seen, I have seen that. And I am at a place and continuing to get more and more captured by that spirit. There's times where, you know, some people ask me, why don't you say something? Why don't you react that way? Why don't you? And it's like, I can't. I can't. And it's not like I'm biting my teeth like I can't. No, I just, I can't. I can only do what Jesus has done for me, in me, and through me. I I can't. He has, I'm crucified with Christ. That Rene is gone. I'm a different person. You, I trust me when I tell you this, and my kids should not say amen, but you would not recognize me 20 years ago. Amen. Oh, said not say amen. It's unbelievable. Well, at least she didn't go, amen. <laughs> she just kind of little, amen. Because although I knew Jesus, I hadn't given him full possession. And, and let me tell you what, you'd be surprised how long I can lecture. I know some of you go, no, we can't. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Ask my husband and my kids later. Right. So there's this, there is a point, though, for me where I've gotten to this place where, yeah, I just, I can't. I can only do what the Father, and I just want to keep that more and more. I know him because of what Jesus gave me, that advocate, that spirit of truth which was given to me. You know, I know so many of us want that kind of closeness to God, to Jesus. But many of us have yet to experience that kind of captivity. Many of us have yet to experience that kind of captivity to the Father, to Jesus. The reality is, many of you have heard this, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Some of you shouldn't say that. You should say, Jesus is my Savior. I think that's interesting. There's, we, we have this phrase, Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And he, is, he, he died to be our Lord and Savior. And many of us, we know him as Savior. We accept that he went to hell for us. We accept who Jesus is and that he's our Savior. So we, we've had, had that salvation. When you can get to the place that Jesus is Lord, think of that word Lord. Lord means he gets to be in charge, not me. Savior doesn't have that language. Can you pick that up? Savior doesn't have, Savior just says, I'm saving you from whatever, right? And, and in this particular case, saving us from hell, saving us from condemnation, right? Saving us from the wrath of God, making us right with God. We get that. We embrace that because we know we can't make ourselves right with God. But the Lord part, eh, that takes on a whole nother thing because Lord denotes that, he's, that he has authority. Um, he is master over my life. And so, for many of us, we accept Jesus as our Savior, but it takes a little time for him to become our Lord, to be completely possessed by his Spirit in us, and to be given over to him. When you can pray the prayer of Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been bought with a price, and my life is no longer my own, but it's his. And so I am captured, I am captivated, I am to the Holy Spirit. We want to know this type of relationship. So how do we move to that place that Jesus had with the Father? Through the Holy Spirit that was given to you. You've been given the tool. You know, it's interesting, you've been given the tool, but you don't know how to use it. And... and the reality is we have a world full of Christians that are running around and have no idea how to use this thing called faith. 
how to use this thing called Jesus Christ, salvation, Holy Spirit. And we're kind of just, just giving a bad representation and misrepresenting it all over the place. It's because most people don't take the time to figure out who is this Holy Spirit, who is this Jesus who actually died for me. Sometimes we think, well, I just know enough. I get it. There's a hell. There's a heaven. I don't want to go there. Jesus did something, so I don't have to go there, and I can go here. That's the easiest class I've ever taken. Thank you, Jesus. See you when I die. And then some of us are just like hanging on till you die. Oh, I can't wait to get to heaven's life. I can't wait till I get to heaven someday. Yeah, I'm miserable. I know. How do you do it? I don't know. I'm just hoping that Jesus is there when I get there. Okay. Do you want to come with me? No. Because wherever you're going is not a happy place. I don't know what that is. Why do you think people don't, aren't drawn to Christians today? We're the most miserable bunch of people that have the greatest gift ever. It's like we're walking around with a million dollars, but we look like hobos or something, you know? It's like, you know, you got this great gift, you ought to do something with it. Right? Because we don't take the time to figure out who this really is. So Jesus said, what, you know, we talked kind of about who, well, what does he do? And we're going to spend two Sundays on that. But just today I want to talk about just a few things. So Jesus said the advocate. When we see advocate, we mean Holy Spirit. The, ho the Holy Spirit will convict me. We all know that, which by the way, if there's some misunderstandings about that, we'll cover that. But he will convict me. He will teach me, and he will remind me of Jesus. Go back to that song, right? The heart of worship. Remind me of you. I'm sorry that I've made this something else. You know, it's a great song, Remind Me Who I Am, and Jason Gray sings that song. It's just a really cool song. But remind us who Christ is, who we are, right? Teach me, convict me. So when the advocate comes, let's look at conviction. He will prove the world to be in wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. And it goes on and explains that a little bit. And I don't want to spend a whole Sunday on conviction. Um, I encourage you to be part of Wednesday night Bible study where we can dissect it a little bit further. But convict really means to prove, that in this particular case, the convict is to prove wrong. Right? You have been convicted. Right? It has been proven that you are wrong. And so the Holy Spirit, a lot of times, there's a misconception about the Holy Spirit. And the only thing people really, and, and, and here's what's dangerous with this misconception. Oftentimes we think that the Holy Spirit is our conscience. So when we do something bad, we feel bad. And we go, oh, the Holy Spirit's convicting me. The Holy Spirit's making me feel bad. Let me tell you something. You've heard this in the church probably before. God doesn't guilt, he convicts. People say it, and then you ask me, like, what's that mean? I don't know, the pastor just says it, so it sounds good. Okay. I'll get back to you, hold on, I'll text him. What does that mean, actually? Right? <clears throat> and so, really what we're saying is, is that the Holy Spirit is just making me feel bad. No, he's not. Because that's, that's a useless, guilt without action, you guys, is a useless emotion. All guilt really does is make you feel bad. Which makes you still think about who? You. We are just the most selfish beings on the planet. We are so focused with me. And you, we're focused with ourselves, Right? And so someone's like, well, I just feel really bad. Well, chances are you feel bad because it made you feel bad, whatever happened. Forget about that you hurt that person, you got caught hurting that person, or something like that. And so then you're like, well, now I feel bad. Well, gosh, let me make you feel better. Hello, idiot, you just made them feel bad. Right? And so then, it's one of the things I tell my students is, is that, and, I, and I'll say it again, one of the biggest missing things in our church today is confession. And I'm not saying our church, first church. I'm saying church, capital C, confession. We have replaced <coughs> confession with feeling bad. <coughs> right? It's like you say, you hurt someone's feelings, you go, well, I feel bad. Okay, well, I feel worse. Yeah, but I feel bad. I hope you know I feel really bad about that. Okay. What, what am I leaving out? Right, which is, I'm sorry. When you say, oh, I, I feel really bad, what am I making it about? Me. When I say, I'm sorry, I hurt you. Because when I say, oh, I feel bad about what I did. 
The other person, oh, don't feel bad. You hurt them. <laughs> and now they're making you feel better. And you've never apologized for what you did. Right? Feeling bad is a useless emotion. Unless it prompts you to do something. The Holy Spirit will say, hey, you're wrong about this. You know what? Wow, you're right. And I need to make it right. I need to <coughs> apologize. I need to confess that. I need to do something in response. I need to stop doing that. It's called repentance. Right? Feeling bad all the time is not the same as confession or taking a wrong and making it right. It simply just makes you still obsessed with you. That's what it does. But the Holy Spirit is, is always kind of accused of being that great guilter. Oh, the Holy Spirit is making you feel bad. It's not making you feel bad. That's not what, that's not what conviction is. It's to prove you wrong about something. And then what do you do with that information? Right? What do I do with what he does to prove me wrong? And so we have to be careful because a lot of times we think that our conscience is the Holy Spirit. And so we want to be careful with that because your conscience oftentimes, especially you guys, if you don't know Jesus, right? If you don't know Jesus, then where are you getting these ideas of what is right and wrong? From yourself or the world or your experiences or your emotions. And so, you know, you want to be careful that you're not just, and again, we tend to hyper-spiritualize things. As if, and, and oftentimes we think that this relationship I have with Jesus um, is, the Holy Spirit will just do it for me. You know, I've heard people say, you know, it's like, well, we don't have to worry because everything will just, you know, God is just going to move in spite of me. You know what, things are going to work out and I don't have to do anything. That's not necessarily true. And so we have to be careful that we don't hyper-spiritualize. You know, God's just going to do something. He doesn't need anything for me to do anything. And that's not really true. So that's why someone was like, well, I don't really need to read the Bible. I don't need to go to discipleship. I don't need to learn what this is. It's okay, the Holy Spirit. You know what, I'm just led by the Spirit. What do you mean you're led by the Spirit? The Spirit just details me. Really? What's the basis for His truth? What do you mean? I mean, where does this truth come from? It just like comes in my head. Okay. And where does that come from? Where did that idea come to get into your head? The Spirit. Okay, we're going to go in circles all day. Right? Is it come from the truth of who Christ is? Or does it come from your ideas that you've kind of shaped and, you know, God help us. It's, I'm telling you what, it's a dangerous place to live, to be a Christian, believe it or not, in Western civilization. It'd be better if you were kind of out in, you know, the villages, maybe in Africa, where you don't, when you're not so influenced by the lies of what Christianity is in Western civilization. They, they actually desperately are hungry for this. In fact, they're willing to die for it. Some of us have three or four of them at home and we don't even open them. Because they understand. It's like, no, i got to have that because that's the truth. I need that. I need that because that, that's the truth of who God is. And, and it's going to tell me. And then I'm going to, and, and I'm reading this and I'm finding out that there's a spirit who's going to remind me of this. And who's going to teach me this. The spirit is going to help me to understand this. He, he helps me to perceive what, who God is. And this is coming alive because of the spirit that was given to me. Oh my gosh, I desperately need this. That's not hyper-spiritual, folks. This is very real. This is not a figment of your imagination. I can throw it at you if it helps. Then you go, oh, smack, that is real. There you go. Now you know. Right? No, nothing nothing hyper-spiritual about that. So, think about this, teach you and remind you. It goes on to say, all this I have spoken to you on, well, what is this? All this, I, and there's that John 14 again. All this I have spoken to you while still with you. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, remind you of everything I have said to you. So see, there's, do you see the relationship of how what he's going to teach us and remind us of the things that Christ has said? So if you are trying to follow the Holy Spirit without the Word of God, you are merely following your hyper-spiritual emotional self. 
which is, I'm telling you right now, self only looks out for self. It'll always tell you what you want to hear. The flesh will always tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to say it again. Your flesh will always tell you what you want to hear. It will lie to you. It is not the friend that will be honest with you. The flesh does that. It is the Spirit of Christ, it is His living Word that is truth, that He reminds us and speaks to us, and reminds of everything He has said to you. All this, if you look at John chapter 14, a little bit before that, Jesus says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And then it goes on to this verse that's up there. All this that I'm talking about, all this I have spoken with you while still with you. So many of us want to love the Lord without obeying him. We like, it sounds good to say he's my Lord and Savior, but really he's just your Savior. You haven't moved over to him being your Lord. You haven't been totally captured by his spirit. You know, and that, you know, I think one of the things, too, this morning that kind of came to me because it was a hot mess this morning and, you know, obviously we started 10 minutes late and we didn't have a lot of different things. That's what happens when, you know, people text us Sunday morning. Just love that, you know, and now we're scrambling because, you know, we don't have a drummer. We're hoping that he was going to be here and so we're kind of running around and it's a little bit crazy. And I'm sitting here, and it's just like, oh my gosh, this is just a mess. And, and Kayla's, you know, stressed, and you got to throw her a bone on that. I'd be stressed, too, to have to do what she does every Sunday with very little gratitude from, from us. And, you know, I just told her, just remember why we do it. Just remember why we do this. Just remember why we do this. You know, it's all about Jesus. That's what we do. He reminds us of who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit, when we're, when we're getting consumed with the day-to-day -day life and the miserable things, the Holy Spirit comes in and reminds you, hey, hey, you know, I'm here. And it just brings a perspective. You know, it just brings us a perspective. He will teach us. He will remind us. We'll talk next week about some other really powerful things he does for us. Uh, but we have to understand who this Holy Spirit is. There's a... There's a story, you know, I don't know how many of you, I encourage my leadership on Thursday, and I would encourage you to do the same. And I've probably said this before, but if you ever look at the disciples, before Pentecost, before the Holy Spirit came down, Jesus went back up, the Holy Spirit comes down and empowers, and kind of captures the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and then there's this whole different group of disciples. It's the same guys, but they're just different. I mean, they're just completely different. Their whole focus focus was different. And let's go back to when Jesus said, I had to go through Samaria. Jesus, I have to go. There's God is directing us. I have to go this way. Jesus didn't know about the woman, but God did. And if you know that story of Jesus at the well, he has this encounter with this woman at the well. And at the end of it, now see the disciples, Jesus says, I'm going to sit and stop. And he stops at this well where this woman eventually comes. Well, the disciples says, we're going to go into town to get some food because, after all, we have to eat, right? I mean, come on. This is real stuff. we got to eat. So they go into town to get food. Jesus hangs out with the woman at the well. When, Jesus, when the disciples come back, they see Jesus talking to this woman, and they decide they're not going to say anything. They're not going to ask her because the Bible says, what do you, they talk to themselves to say, what do you want? Or kind of, um, I can't even remember what they say to the, or think to say to Jesus. But essentially, their thought was to ask this woman, what is it you're doing here? What is it you're doing here? But they didn't. They didn't ask that question. They just turned to Jesus like, you need to eat something. At this time, the woman had left. She went into town to tell the people that she had met a man who could be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so the disciples say to Jesus, come on, what are you doing? You know, I don't, we don't want to know what you're doing. Just eat some food. And Jesus says, you know, I have food you guys know nothing about. And the disciples say to themselves, somebody bring him food? They are obsessed with the flesh. 
They are obsessed with eating and, and traveling in this. Come on, we're on mission, Jesus. we got to get to Galilee. There's people to, to, that you're supposed to preach to and do whatever it is that you do. We need to take you to go and do these things, right? And Jesus tells them, open your eyes and I tell you, there's a harvest in front of you and you can't see it. Open your eyes and see. Because what the disciples don't know, at the very moment that they're thinking about food and the mission and everything they have to do, life which we all get consumed with. Some of you are sitting here this morning completely obsessed and consumed with life. And because of that, you're missing the spirit that has you, that's in you and wants to be set free and you can't see it. And so the disciples are just consumed with life and Jesus says, open your eyes and see. Because at that very moment, what the disciples didn't know is this woman had gone into town and said, I'm pretty sure I just met the Messiah. you got to come find out. And her words spoken had to come with such truth because here this woman, who's not a good woman, tells the people in town that they get up to go check out who she finds. So they believe her. There's something different about this woman that makes them follow her to meet the Messiah. But the disciples don't know this is happening. They come to see Jesus, and many receive Christ that day. And the word of Jesus spreads because now they've seen Jesus, not just because of the woman. Now we've met the Messiah. And the disciples are oblivious that this is happening. They don't know that this, at this very moment Jesus says, you guys are thinking about food, but what you don't realize is I just planted a seed that's going all the way back into Samaria, and they're going to come to find out, and more people are going to find out about me. But you're consumed with life and what's happening in your schedule and your food. When you look at those disciples, and then you look at the disciples, the same Peter in Acts chapter 4, him and John heal. Uh, uh, a, a beggar and they kind of get in trouble for doing it and they're brought in to, to question and then they even say are we being brought in here because we showed kindness to someone right because basically the man is begging and they said silver and gold we do not have but what we do have we give you in the name of Jesus Christ stand up walk and be free and so this man was they didn't recognize the woman but now filled with the Holy Spirit they stop and they see this man they say, we want to tell you about Jesus. And so when they get called into question about it, their answers, they got called in again, and they were commanded not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus, because this Jesus thing was just spreading like wildfire. But Peter and John replies to the authority and says, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. When you look at the disciples before and after Pentecost, there is a whole different kind of surrender. Because, hey, you guys, the disciples gave up family, jobs, money to follow Jesus. They gave their life to follow Jesus. So it's not like you can say that they just heard about Jesus and now they're following Jesus. No, they followed Jesus for three years. So what was different was that they became completely possessed. Jesus, just like Jesus had promised them, I will live in you. I will live in you. The Spirit of Christ is now in them. And He can be in you in a very real way too. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. I'm going to ask Kayla to join me back up here. I'm curious... Really think about this question, and I have it up here for you. Have you been so captivated by the Holy Spirit that you cannot help speaking about what you've seen and heard? Have you gotten to the place where you are so possessed by God that you cannot help? And if you haven't, then you've got to spend some time this morning in worship going, Lord, what do I need to do? What, what, where do I, what do I need to do where I become totally possessed by? Where you teach me, where you remind me, where you convict me. I think for some of us, we have not embraced conviction. We, again, we have just substituted feeling bad or making excuses. I didn't mean to, right? Instead, allow the Holy Spirit, some of you this morning have already been convicted. You have been proven wrong that what you're doing isn't the correct thing to do. And so now what are you going to do with that? How are you going to respond? 
to them. Right? Are you going to feel bad? Well, then that's just guilt. Or are you going to allow the Holy Spirit to say, this is what you need to be doing? You know, I know pastor talks every week about studying the Bible. She holds it up. She talks about how we really need to understand it. She talks about discipleship. She talks about that. But, you know, I just, I just feel like I could just be led in the Spirit. And maybe you're hearing this morning that it's like, I guess I, that's really just my hyper-spiritual voice in my head. I need to get rooted and listen to the teacher, to Jesus. I need to be reminded of who Jesus is. I need to see him. I need to hear him. I need to know him. If you're not being reminded of who he is, some of you, when I tell you, it's, when I tell you that I meet with Jesus like he's sitting at the table with me, I'm always kind of surprised at how many are kind of weirded out by that. I think some of you are like, that's a little weird. And it's like, he's just not real for me. He's sitting at the table with me where I do my devotions. He's standing in the grocery line with me when I'm going through. When I'm meeting with people, uh, he's there at the table with me. Very mindful of the presence of God. How could I not be? If, if I Let me just tell you this. If I change all of you this morning, a big weight, and you had to carry it around all week, next Sunday I'd be like, how many of you noticed that? I can't imagine I'd be like, you know what? Didn't even notice. Really? Didn't notice you were dragging with your ankle. <sighs> Making all this noise, people are going, what the heck is that? It's a little experiment. <laughs> you come back next Sunday, I'm going to be like, anybody notice you were carrying that around? Yeah, it was kind of awkward. <laughs> Boy, you really became aware of that presence. Well, for me, I am captured by Jesus. I can't go anywhere where he is not. <clears throat> I had to go to Samaria. Because that's what the Lord said. I had to go to Stockton. Trust me, Mark and I visited here before, and I thought, that's like going to Africa. <laughs> you ever been in Vacaville? It's lovely over there. And we used to pick Jamie up, and I was like, yeah, it's a frightening place. My children were traumatized their first day of school here. I was like, Mom, do you know kids say that in class? I'm like, sorry. We had to go to Stockton. <laughs> it could be a scary place, but the Lord is here. Have you been so captured by the Holy Spirit? You had to go to Samaria. Do you have to go and do and speak with Jesus, the living God, and he tells you to do? Let me pray for you this morning that you will be so captured with him that you cannot help but feel his presence in your life. Become so aware of who he is. Father, Lord, I can call you Lord because that is who you are for me. I call you Father because I'm the child and you're the dad. There's so much power just in that name, Father. You are the Father that gives life. You have all authority. You know all. You see all. There is nothing that you do not know. And I thank you, God, that you have revealed yourself in the flesh through Jesus Christ. To show us who you are. To show us how to live your laws. How to live your truths out. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. It was given to us through you and your son Jesus Christ to live in us. That we would be so captured by your love for us. Many of us really, we get that illustration have to carry around something that we're so aware of because it's right there. We can't leave the house with it. Lord, may you become, so that we become so captured in that same way. The people ask us, what is it? Where do you get that? Why do you respond that way? What is it that you have? We could say we have you, Father God. The living God, living in us, moving us to follow, to obey. The Spirit of God that's been given to us to remind us. Because you know, God, we're still in this world. And that enemy, the devil, is still prowling around, looking for someone to devour, to speak lives into us, Lord. To speak 
No truth, Lord. Deception. Condemnation. That you have left your spirit to call out that liar. You have left your spirit to remind us of who you are. To teach us of your truths. To guide us in all righteousness. May we be carried along by your spirit, God. May we seek to know you. I pray, Lord, this morning as we spend time in worship and just sit with some of these truths that you've spoken. Lord, that we do not walk away feeling bad. We do not walk away feeling guilty. But maybe that we walk away being convinced that we were wrong. And that you made it right. And we walk away with a new truth. A new Lord of our life. Help us, Lord, to be surrendered to you the same way Jesus was to you, Father God. But we had to go. We have to speak. We have to obey. Thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit in us. Would you meet us, Lord, in the elements this morning? Remind us of the powerful truth of who you are. Thank you that you left that reminder of who you are and what you've done for us to allow the Spirit to live in us. Praise you this morning. You say all these things in the powerful name of Jesus.